I've taken up a summer job at one of the fire lookout towers, nestled deep within the heart of Southern California. I'm just a teenager, eager to escape the repetitive high school life and experience something different. I thought this was the perfect opportunity to spend more time in nature and have a relaxing summer. Plus, the pay was quite good too. The tower, reminiscent of stories I've come across, stands tall and solitary, perched on a peak that provides a panoramic view of the endless stretch of trees. From sunrise to sunset, my eyes sweep across the horizon, vigilantly watching for the slightest hint of smoke or any potential fire hazards. As darkness blankets the forest, the nocturnal symphony of crickets and distant owl hoots becomes my sole companion. Inside the tower, the room I've made my temporary home is simple, yet it offers everything I need. A wooden desk occupies one corner, cluttered with topographical maps and notes about the forest's various regions. Next to the large window sits a binocular stand, which I frequently use to get a closer look at the vast forest. And then there's the small radio set, connecting me to other towers and the world beyond these trees. The initial days in the tower posed a challenge. The contrast between this quiet existence and the town I left behind was jarring. But as the days blended into weeks, a transformation occurred. The once overpowering silence became a comforting presence. It enveloped me, allowing my thoughts to flow freely, granting me moments of introspection and opening doors to daydreams I never knew I had. As I settled into this new routine, I realized that this tower, with its solitude, was offering me a unique opportunity to truly understand myself and the world around me. One afternoon, as the sun hangs low in the sky, casting elongated shadows over the dense canopy of trees, I feel the urge to stretch my legs and break free from the confines of the tower. The idea of a foot patrol around the tower's perimeter seems like the perfect break. As I descend the tower's steps, the world around me comes alive. The air, fresh and crisp, fills my lungs, rejuvenating me with every breath. Beneath my feet, the carpet of dried leaves and twigs crunch. Venturing deeper into the woods, I am drawn to a narrow, winding path that seems less traveled. The towering trees on either side form a natural archway, their branches intertwining high above, occasionally allowing rays of sunlight to pierce through, creating intricate patterns on the forest floor. The gentle murmur of distant insects, the occasional rustling of leaves as a squirrel darts past, and the distant calls of birds fill the air. As I continue my journey, I come across a serene clearing with a small babbling brook meandering through. The water, clear and cool, reflects the sky above, shimmering with the gentle dance of sunlight. I kneel down, cupping my hands to take a sip. The water tastes pure, with an earthy undertone. Drawn by the allure of the unknown, I follow the brook, letting it guide me further into the forest. Here, the trees grow denser, their leaves forming a thick canopy that filters the sunlight, casting everything in a soft, emerald hue. The atmosphere is thick with the scent of damp moss, wildflowers, and the subtle undertones of decaying wood. Continuing my exploration, the dense canopy begins to thin out, revealing a clearing up ahead. The sunlight illuminates the forest floor, and from a distance, I notice the faint outline of a person. Intrigued, I quicken my pace, eager to meet another person in this secluded part of the woods. But as I draw closer, a chilling realization dawns on me. The figure in the distance bears an uncanny resemblance to me. The same posture, and even the same clothes. I stop in my tracks, my heart pounding against my ribcage. Squinting, I try to discern any differences, any sign that this is just another hiker with a coincidental resemblance. But the details are unmistakable. The same scuffed boots, the way the backpack sits on the shoulders, and even the slight tilt of the head. I blink repeatedly, hoping that each time my eyes reopen, the figure morphs into something or someone more familiar and less unsettling. But it remains, standing still and silent. Hello? I call out my voice echoing through the trees, hoping for a response. Nothing. 
The only reply I receive is the haunting silence of the forest, punctuated by the distant chirping of birds and the rustle of leaves in the wind. Taking a deep breath of the cool forest air, I try to calm the whirlwind of emotions swirling within me. This has to be some optical illusion, a trick of the light, or perhaps a fleeting product of my overworked mind seeking company in this solitude, I reason with myself. Yet, despite these rationalizations, a persistent, unsettling feeling gnaws at the back of my mind, refusing to let me brush the experience off as mere fancy. Mustering up the courage, I take a tentative step towards the figure. However, the more I advance, the more elusive the figure becomes. It's as if we are connected by an invisible tether, ensuring we maintain a constant distance from one another. Its movements are eerily synchronized with mine, retreating with every step I take forward. A cocktail of emotions brews within me, the raw fear of the unexplained, intertwined with an insatiable curiosity about this forest-bound mystery. I halt, my eyes fixed on the doppelganger. For a brief moment, our gazes lock, and then, as if succumbing to the forest's will, the figure begins to dissolve, its form blending seamlessly with the surrounding shadows until it is nothing but a mere memory. My heart still racing, I turn on my heel, and the urge to seek the familiar safety of the tower overpowers any lingering curiosity. The once soothing sounds of the forest now feel ominous. Reaching the tower, I quickly climb up the stairs, and the wooden steps of the fire watchtower creak softly under my weight as I ascend, each step taking me further away from the unsettling sight I had just witnessed. Inside the tower, the familiar surroundings offered a fleeting sense of security. My eyes dart around, taking in the maps scattered on the desk, the binocular stand by the window, and the small radio set. Sitting down, I try to process the surreal encounter. Shaking off the unease, I reach for the radio, turning the dial to Jamie's frequency. A neighboring tower operator, and over the weeks, he had become a trusted friend. Jamie, I began, my voice slightly trembling. You won't believe what I just saw. There was a brief pause before Jamie's calm voice cut through the static. What happened, Alex? I take a deep breath, trying to order my thoughts. I don't even know how to explain it. I was out on patrol, and I saw someone in the distance. Jamie, he looked just like me, same clothes and same everything. There's a longer pause this time. I can picture Jamie's skeptical, raised eyebrow. Come on, Alex. It's just the isolation getting to you. That, or the reflections and shadows playing tricks. The forest does that. I run a hand through my hair, frustration mounting. That's the thing, Jamie. It felt so real. I called out, but he, or it, just stared back. Didn't move or respond. Just stood there, watching. Jamie lets out a soft sigh. Look, I get it. This job, it's lonely. The forest is vast, and sometimes our minds play tricks on us. Maybe it was another hiker or a camper who just happened to be wearing similar clothes. Or maybe, just maybe, you saw a reflection or shadow. I want to believe Jamie, I really do. But a gnawing feeling at the back of my mind tells me otherwise. It's just the way he looked at me, like he was studying me. Alex, we're out here to watch for fires, not get lost in our heads. Try to shake it off and focus on the job. But hey, if it makes you feel better, keep an eye out and radio me if you see anything else. The conversation shifts to lighter topics, but my mind is elsewhere. Every rustle in the underbrush makes me jump. The sensation of being watched is inescapable. Grateful for his company, I signed off, feeling a bit lighter. But as I settled in for the night, the image of the doppelganger lingered, casting shadows over my thoughts and dreams. With every passing day, the inescapable sensation of being watched becomes more noticeable, a looming presence in the back of my mind. I catch myself constantly glancing at the glassy surfaces of ponds, expecting to see a reflection other than my own. Even the gentle sway of tree shadows seems to carry an ominous whisper of the unknown. 
One particularly humid afternoon, as I trudge along the worn forest path, a cold shiver crawls up my spine. The forest, which is usually filled with the sounds of birds and rustling leaves, falls into an unsettling silence. My steps become more cautious and my breathing more deliberate. An overpowering sense of foreboding fills the air. I'm not alone. The sudden realization stops me in my tracks. I hesitantly turn around, dreading the sight that might greet me. And there he is, no longer a distant figure but only a thirty feet away. He is bathed in a shaft of sunlight, illuminating every familiar detail, from the frayed hem of my jeans to the small scar on my cheek. My heart races. Who the hell are you? I demand, struggling to keep my voice steady. But the haunting echo of my words is the only response I get. The moment our eyes meet, a jolt of terror rushes through me. Every feature, every detail is an exact match, from the strands of hair that sway with the breeze to the shoes covered in the same pattern of mud and dirt. The only difference is the hollow, lifeless gaze that seems to pierce right through me. Without a second thought, I turn on my heel and bolt. Branches snag at my clothes as I sprint, and the undergrowth trips me up more than once. But the adrenaline and raw fear propel me forward. I dare a glance back and immediately regret it. The doppelganger is on my tail, mirroring my movements, but with a grace and speed that seems inhuman. There's an uncanny silence to its pursuit, a silence that's more unsettling than the frantic pounding of my heart. Ahead, I see the clearing where my tower stands. It rises like a beacon, offering a potential haven from whatever is chasing me. But the distance between me and safety seems to stretch on endlessly. With every step I take, my lungs scream for air and my muscles cry out in protest. But the thought of what might happen if I stop or falter spurs me on. I hear the radio static in my pocket, Jamie's voice calling out, filled with concern. But I can't spare the breath to respond. I only focus on the rhythmic pounding of my feet and the sight of the tower's door ahead. As I near the base of the tower, I practically throw myself up the stairs, taking them two at a time. A gust of wind carries the faintest hint of a whisper, something that sounds chillingly like my own voice. But I don't dare look back now. With one final leap, I reach the top, slamming the door behind me and locking it. Panting heavily, I collapse against the wooden floor of the tower. The vastness of the forest stretches out below, but all I can hear is the rapid drumming of my heart. The radio feels heavy in my hand, and I clutch it tightly, trying to steady my breathing. Jamie, I begin, my voice trembling despite my attempts to keep it steady. I don't think it's human. Its movements, its eyes. Everything was just... wrong. Jamie takes a moment before responding. All right, let's not jump to conclusions, Jamie says. Their voice is a mixture of stern calmness and palpable tension. We need to think rationally. It could be someone playing a prank and trying to scare you. I shake my head, even though I know Jamie can't see me. The thought that this might be a prank is almost as terrifying as the alternative. No one can replicate someone else to such an extent, Jamie. This isn't a prank. It... It was like looking into a distorted mirror where everything is eerily wrong. I believe you, Jamie says, their voice softening. But we've got to stay level-headed. Now tell me everything you saw, every detail. We need to figure out what we're dealing with. As I tell him my encounter, describing the cold, vacant stare and the unnatural grace of its movements, I can feel Jamie's growing concern. Okay, this is... This is weird, Jamie admits, a note of fear creeping into their voice. But you're safe inside the tower, Alex. It can't get in. But what if it can, Jamie? It looks exactly like me. It might know everything I know, including how to get inside this tower, I reply, my voice rising in panic. We won't let that happen, Jamie responds their determination piercing through the static of the radio. First, we need to ensure you're safe. 
Do you have anything in the tower you can use to barricade the door? I look around frantically, my eyes landing on the heavy table in the corner of the room. Yes, there's a table here. I can use it to block the door. With trembling hands, I drag the table across the floor, positioning it against the door. All right, the door is barricaded, I say, leaning against the makeshift barrier. Good. Stay put, Alex. And whatever happens, do not open that door, Jamie orders, their voice carrying a weight of responsibility that grounds me in the moment. I won't, Jamie. I trust you, I reply. As the minutes drag on, the tower seems to shrink around me, each creak and groan of the aged wood echoing louder and louder in my ears. The vastness of the forest outside my windows makes me feel more trapped than ever, like a mouse cornered by a predator. My eyes keep darting to the radio, hoping for any reassuring message from Jamie. Suddenly, a soft tapping sound emerges from the other side of the barricaded door, catching my attention. It's almost rhythmic, but grows louder with every passing second. My heart races, and I step back from the door, eyes wide. Alex? The voice is chillingly familiar. It's mine, or at least an imitation of it. Alex, it's me. Can you let me in? No. I manage to whisper, my voice hoarse. The tapping turns into banging, and the force from the other side begins to push against the table I've used as a barricade. I just want to talk, the voice continues, still using my own tones but slightly off, as if it's not used to forming the words. Let me in. The radio remains silent, which feels even more ominous. I fumble with it, desperate to reach Jamie. Jamie, are you there? I almost shout into it. For a moment, there's nothing but static. And then, Jamie's voice comes through, albeit more distant than before. Alex, stay calm. We need to figure this out together. The banging against the door intensifies, causing the table to shift slightly. Panic rises in my chest. It's trying to get in, Jamie. Stay away from the door. Do you have anything you can use to defend yourself? I look around frantically, spotting a fire extinguisher on the wall. Grabbing it, I say, I've got a fire extinguisher. It's heavy. Might buy me some time. The persistent thudding on the door stops abruptly, replaced by an eerie silence. The sudden quiet is even more unsettling. I strain my ears, trying to hear any sign of movement outside. And then, from below the tower, I hear a low, unsettling hum, almost like a song, but in a language or tone I don't recognize. Jamie, it's... singing? My voice is full of disbelief. Whatever it's trying to do, you can't let it get to you. Keep focused and stay safe, Jamie advises, their voice firm. Time feels like it's stretching endlessly. The hum from below ceases, and the pressing weight against the door disappears, plunging everything into unsettling quietness once more. Over the next few days, the forest doesn't offer any peace. Daylight hours are strained with an ever-present sensation of being watched, like the trees themselves have eyes. I catch glimpses of the doppelganger repeatedly. One morning, as I am surveying the forest from the tower's deck, I spot the figure standing at the tree line, mirroring my stance perfectly. Later, as I am walking a trail for a routine patrol, I feel a presence behind me. Turning around, there it is, mimicking my movements with an eerie precision. I break into a run, not daring to look back, fearing that I would see it right on my heels, with my own face twisted into a predatory grin. On another day, it escalates further. While in the tower, I catch sight of it in different places, always watching me. It's relentless, not allowing me a moment's peace. Sometimes it appears near the base of the tower, other times in the distance, disappearing and reappearing with a speed that's humanly impossible. As the sun sets, I see it standing at the edge of the clearing, the fading sunlight casting long, sinister shadows that stretch towards the tower, as if trying to reach me. I barely sleep. The nights are punctuated with its attempts to communicate, to lure me out. It calls out my name in a sing-song voice, using my voice, but it sounds wrong and distorted, 
sending chills down my spine each time. The cool evening air surrounds me as I'm finishing up my patrol, the night punctuated only by the soft chirping of crickets. Suddenly my radio comes to life and Jamie's voice cuts through the static. The panic in Jamie's tone makes my heart race. Alex, are you, are you outside my tower? Jamie's voice trembles, each word sounding rushed. I furrow my brow in confusion. No, I'm on my way back to my tower. Why? What's happening? There's a heavy pause before Jamie replies, voice even shakier. Something's out here, and it looked like you. It was staring up at my tower. Fear grips me, especially after my recent encounters with the doppelganger. Stay put, Jamie. I'm coming over. The forest is different at night, the shadows deeper, and every rustling leaf or snapped twig sends my imagination into overdrive. The thought of my doppelganger lurking makes the journey even more nerve-wracking. When I finally approach Jamie's tower, everything seems eerily calm. No signs of struggle, no visible disturbances, just the soft hum of the wind through the trees. But as I near the entrance, an unsettling quiet sets in. Taking a deep breath, I muster up the courage and call out, my voice breaking the quiet. Jamie, it's Alex. Are you in there? My words seem to hang in the air, waiting for an answer. The following silence is heavy and amplifies my anxiety. Every instinct tells me something isn't right. Slowly, I ascend the wooden steps leading to the tower's entrance. I notice the door is slightly open. I push the door gently, revealing the room bathed in dim light from a single lantern. At a cursory glance, it appears as though Jamie just stepped out for a moment. But as I survey the surroundings, the small anomalies become evident. A chair is haphazardly pushed back. Jamie's binoculars are placed lens down. But what catches my attention is the cup on the floor, with its contents partially spilled. A small pool of coffee glistens under the lantern light, and I can feel the residual warmth when I touch the cup. Whatever or whoever caused Jamie to abandon his post must have taken him off guard, and that realization sends a chill down my spine. Trying to shake off the unsettling feeling, I start to systematically inspect the room. I first approach the desk, where an array of papers lie scattered. Among them, a hastily written note catches my attention. The ink is smudged and the handwriting is unsteady. It reads, Odd movements near the North Ridge, not animals. Need to be cautious. My mind races, attempting to decipher the meaning behind Jamie's vague words. Could this be connected to my own unsettling experiences in the forest? Next, I turn to the small cot pushed against the far wall. The blankets are rumpled, looking like they've been kicked aside in a hurry. There's an indentation on the pillow, suggesting Jamie was resting here not too long ago. Then, my gaze drifts towards the window, which offers a panoramic view of the forest below. The setting sun casts an orange glow making the treetops look ablaze. In the fading light, something catches my eye, a swift movement near the tree line. I notice a patch of mud near the window. The shape is odd. It doesn't seem to be either human or animal. Gulping, I grab the radio, hoping to reach Jamie. Jamie, where are you? Answer me. But only static replies. Taking a deep breath, I realize I need to leave. The feeling of being watched returns, more intense than before. As I make my way out of the tower, I'm hyper-aware of every sound and every movement. A chilling thought begins to form, slowly but unmistakably. The creature I've seen, the doppelganger lurking in the forest, might now be wearing Jamie's face. My heart hammers against my chest, a mix of fear and determination urging me forward. If that creature is out there impersonating Jamie, I need to find it and put an end to this nightmare. Taking a deep breath, I venture into the forest near where I'd spotted the movement earlier. The descending darkness amplifies every rustle and crack, the looming trees casting a labyrinth of shadows. The moonlight filters through the canopy, painting a silvered path that I tread cautiously. Jamie? I call out hesitantly, my voice echoing back at me. A silent response, 
Only the whisper of the wind heightens my anxiety. After what feels like hours, I spot a figure standing near a clearing, its silhouette illuminated by the soft glow of the moon. Drawing nearer, a pit forms in my stomach. While the distance and shadows had concealed its finer features, up close there's no denying the haunting reality. This is not Jamie, not really. Though the face and the clothes are all familiar, something fundamental is wrong. It's as though someone took Jamie's body and hollowed it out, leaving behind just a shell. The creature's eyes lock onto mine, and any lingering hope that this might be my friend evaporates. Those eyes, which should have been warm and comforting, are cold, devoid of any humanity. They seem to study me and assess me like a hunter sizing up its prey. A surge of fear propels me into action. My mind races, conjuring hasty plans to evade this creature who wears Jamie's face. I can't let panic dictate my actions. I have to be smart about this. I know you're not Jamie, I declare firmly, doing my best to mask the fear that is threatening to consume me. The creature tilts its head slightly, the predatory gleam in its eyes intensifying. I... I don't know what you are, but you won't fool me with that face, I continue, my voice wavering slightly. The creature, mimicking Jamie's voice perfectly, responds with a chilling laugh that echoes through the forest, the sound grating against my nerves. I just want to talk, Alex, it says, taking a step closer. Its voice is almost comforting, a dangerous lure in the dark and cold forest. But I know better. I cannot allow myself to be tricked by its deceit. I reach down, gripping a hefty branch that lies at my feet. Stay back, I warn, as I hold the branch in front of me. It stops, and for a moment, the forest is plunged into an eerie silence. The creature smiles a grotesque caricature of Jamie's smile. Thinking quickly, I remember the flare gun we keep for emergencies back at the tower. It might be my only chance. Without another word, I turn and sprint back the way I came. The creature gives chase, and I pray to reach the tower before it reaches me. Branches whip against my face as I run, but I don't feel the pain. All that matters now is survival. I reach the tower, my lungs burning with the effort. With shaking hands, I fumble to unlock the door, throwing it open and slamming it shut behind me. I don't dare to glance back, fearing the sight that might greet me. I scramble to the storage cabinet, pulling out the flare gun and a flare. I load it quickly as my hands are slick with sweat. As I turn back to the door, I see the creature, Jamie's face distorted in a snarl, barreling towards me. With a scream that tears from my throat, I fire the flare directly at it. The forest lights up, painting everything in a harsh red glow. The creature staggers back, its form flickering and shifting, caught between Jamie's and its true, monstrous form. I don't wait to see if it falls. I make my way down the tower, fleeing into the darkness of the forest. Behind me, I hear a terrible scream, filled with anger and pain. I run until I can run no more, until the first light of dawn begins to break through the trees. Days turn into weeks, and the summer comes to a close. On my last day, I stand at the base of the lookout tower, looking up, as the memories of the past few months overwhelm me. The sun dips below the horizon, casting long shadows that stretch across the clearing. The air is tinged with the familiar scents of the forest, but it no longer comforts me as it once did. Each rustling leaf or distant bird call sends a shiver down my spine. Sitting in my car, I take one last look at the tower. I think of all the other lookouts who may come after me, and I silently hope they never have to confront the horrors I did. Turning the key, the engine roars to life, breaking the heavy silence that has settled around me. The trees form a dense canopy overhead as I navigate the winding roads, the dense greenery gradually thinning out as I approach the forest's edge. Memories play in my mind like an old film reel, the laughter shared, the mysteries unraveled, and the close encounters that nearly cost me everything. With each mile I put between me and the forest, the weight on my chest lightens, 
but it never truly disappears. I wake up in a hospital bed with a white sheet pulled up to my chest. The room is sterile, illuminated by fluorescent lights overhead. My head is pounding like a drum, and my vision is slightly out of focus. A doctor is next to me, holding a clipboard and flipping through some papers attached to it. He's in a white coat and has a stethoscope hanging around his neck. Good, you're awake, the doctor says, glancing up from the clipboard to make eye contact. His eyes are brown, and his voice carries a tone of professional concern. Confused. My head hurts, I reply, trying to shift my position. I notice I'm wearing a hospital gown, and there are bandages wrapped around my left arm and leg. You were in a car accident, the doctor continues. You have some bumps and bruises, and we had to put some stitches in your arm. But all your vital signs are stable. The CT scan showed no major injuries. However, you're experiencing some memory loss. Memory loss? I ask. Yes, he answers, setting the clipboard down on a nearby counter. It's not uncommon after traumatic events. You might find it difficult to recall certain details, maybe even larger chunks of time, but it's usually temporary. Our plan is to start you on a combination of physical and psychological therapy. You'll work with a team of healthcare providers, including a physical therapist for your injuries and a psychologist to help you regain your memory. A nurse walks in, holding a tray with a glass of water and some pills. Time for your medication, she says, placing the tray on the adjustable table next to my bed. The doctor picks up the pills and hands them to me. These are for pain and inflammation. We've also prescribed something to help you sleep. Rest is crucial for your recovery. I take the pills and wash them down with water. My mind is racing, filled with questions about the car accident, my injuries, and most of all, the memory loss. But for now, I decide to focus on what's immediately in front of me, getting better and following the doctor's plan. I'll tackle the other issues when the time is right. For the next few days, I follow the hospital regimen diligently. My mornings begin with a nurse checking my vitals. Then I attend physical therapy sessions where they guide me through exercises designed to strengthen my limbs and improve coordination. The therapists are patient but firm, pushing me to go beyond what I think my limits are. In between physical exercises, I have appointments with a psychologist, Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams asks me questions about my past, shows me images, and assigns me small memory tasks. She assures me this will help bridge the gaps in my recollection. Think of it as piecing together a puzzle, she often says. But what if some pieces are missing? When I'm alone, I browse through my social media accounts on a tablet the hospital provides. It's strange to see my own life laid out in pictures and status updates. There's a dissonance between the person smiling back in the photos and the empty slate that I am now. I find it equally comforting and disorienting to read messages from friends who act like everything is normal when clearly it's not. My friends and family visit regularly. Their presence fills the room with a warmth that the sterile hospital environment lacks. Through their stories, I start to get a sense of who I was. Apparently, a sociable person with a love for hiking and a knack for cooking. Yet, as much as I want to share their enthusiasm, their stories sound like they belong to someone else. However, something starts to gnaw at me. I begin experiencing flashbacks that stand out against the narrative being built around me. I see myself in a clinical setting. People in white coats are moving around. There's a whir of machines, and voices talk about dosages, trial groups, and effects. Adding to my confusion, these flashbacks often feature a badge emblazoned with the acronym DREAM. The scenes feel as real as the hospital room I am sitting in, right down to the cold touch of steel lab tables and the persistent beep of monitors. Unlike the bits and pieces I manage to remember during therapy, these flashbacks don't fade away. They imprint themselves onto my consciousness, becoming a part of my reality. During my next therapy session, I decide to bring it up. I've been having some strange flashbacks, I finally say, 
breaking the silence. They're not about a car accident. They're about labs and tests, people in white coats, machines, badges with acronyms. They're very unsettling. Dr. Williams leans back in her chair, her eyes narrowing as she studies me. She's not taking notes now, which makes me uneasy. Flashbacks can sometimes be your brain's way of healing itself, she replies cautiously. At this stage, the mind can mix fantasy and reality. It's not unusual, given the trauma you've been through. Right now, your primary focus should be on your recovery. I nod my head as if I agree, but inside, skepticism churns. Her words might make sense to anyone else, but the dissonance between what she's saying and what I'm experiencing is too strong to ignore. It feels like she's skirting around something, or maybe I'm reading too much into it. Either way, I'm not convinced. That night, I lie in my hospital bed, staring at the ceiling. The room is dimly lit. The only sounds are the distant hum of machinery and the occasional footsteps of nurses in the corridor. My mind keeps circling back to the flashbacks, each detail vivid and intrusive. I can't just push them aside. The urge to investigate becomes too strong to ignore. I've noticed the nurses check on me less frequently late at night. I figure that's my best window of opportunity. So, I wait. Wait until the hands of the wall clock inch towards midnight and the hospital falls into a deeper quiet. Finally, I decide it's time. I swing my legs over the side of the bed, wincing as a jolt of pain goes through my still aching body. I'm in my hospital gown. The fabric is thin and barely adequate, but it will have to do. I glance toward the door, half expecting a nurse to walk in, but nothing happens. The coast is clear. Slowly, deliberately, I stand up. My legs feel weak, but they hold. I take a deep breath and step towards the door, my heart pounding in my chest. The door handle is cold to the touch as I carefully turn it, wincing at the soft click it makes as it unlatches. I open the door a crack and peek outside. The corridor is empty. I slip out of my room, my bare feet cold on the tiled floor. Each step I take is calculated, my ears straining for any sound that suggests I've been discovered. But all I hear is the distant murmur of voices and the occasional beep of machines. I'm fueled by a mix of adrenaline and purpose, intent on uncovering the truth lurking in the depths of my fragmented memories. It's a risk, but one I feel compelled to take. The hospital is a complicated layout of corridors, elevators, and rooms. But I remember spotting an office labeled Medical Records during one of my earlier walks. It's not too far from my wing, just past the cafeteria and down a dimly lit hallway. My heart is pounding as I navigate the turns, keenly aware that I shouldn't be here. I know it's illegal to dig into medical files without authorization, but the need for answers, the compulsion to validate my flashbacks, pushes any concerns about legality to the back of my mind. I reach the office and find it empty, no surprise given the late hour. The door is locked, but a quick glance around reveals a spare key hidden under a potted plant on a nearby shelf. My hands are shaking as I insert the key and turn the lock. I slip inside, closing the door softly behind me. The room is filled with rows of filing cabinets, a couple of computers, and stacks of paperwork on a cluttered desk. I head straight for the filing cabinets. They're organized alphabetically, and it doesn't take me long to find the drawer marked with my last name. My heart is in my throat as I pull it open and start flipping through the folders. Then I see it. My file. It's much thicker than I expected, bulging with papers and fastened with multiple rubber bands and paper clips. Carefully, I take out my file and place it on the desk. I skim through the first few pages, basic information, medical history, details about the supposed car accident. But then I come across addendums that stops me cold. Patient name, James Turner, medical record number 47582-9081. Date of birth, redacted. Date of admission, redacted. 
primary physician, doctor redacted, diagnosis, post-traumatic amnesia, multiple contusions, mild concussion. Addendum 1. Date. Redacted. Note by Dr. Redacted. Subject has shown great resilience to phase one of the dream project. Memory wipe partially successful. Minor glitches observed, specifically the subject's ability to recall specific details associated with dream project during psychological evaluations. Further observation needed for phase two. Recommend increasing dosage of redacted to ensure successful memory manipulation. Addendum 2. Date. Redacted. Note by Dr. Redacted Phase 2 of Dream Project Initiated. Introduction of false memories has commenced, particularly related to the car accident scenario. Early results are promising. Subject has shown high receptiveness to implanted memories. Ongoing monitoring is crucial to gauge long-term stability. Addendum 3. Date. Redacted. Note by Dr. Redacted Phase 2. Update. Subject is demonstrating increasing resistance to implanted memories. Frequent flashbacks to Dream Project Labs reported during psychotherapy sessions. Recommend immediate transition to Phase 3 to prevent potential compromise of the project. Authorization for implementation of Redacted is requested. End of file Dream Project. Memory wipe. Phases. This is no ordinary medical file. It reads more like a progress report for some sort of experiment. My mind races as I try to process what I'm seeing. Who are these people and what have they done to me? Why is my medical file filled with notes about a project that has nothing to do with car accidents and recovery? Suddenly, I hear footsteps down the hall, getting closer. My heart starts to pound louder. It feels like it's going to burst out of my chest. In a rush, I shove my file back into its drawer, making sure it's exactly where I found it. I bolt out of the office, softly but quickly closing the door behind me. I make my way back through the hospital, retracing my steps as quickly as my aching body allows. I reach my room just as the footsteps turn into the hallway where the office is located. I slide into my bed and pull the covers over me, pretending to be asleep but fully alert. My heart is still racing, and my mind is buzzing with the information I've uncovered. I hear the footsteps pass by my room and slowly fade away, and only then do I let out a sigh of relief. The next morning, the doctor walks in, carrying his clipboard and wearing a smile. How did you sleep? he asks, pulling out a stethoscope and checking my heartbeat. Not well, I say, maintaining eye contact with him, as if challenging him to read my thoughts. Bad dreams. The doctor nods as he jots down some notes. Well, that's to be expected, he says, offering a reassuring but somehow empty smile. Your brain is still healing. It'll take some time. Is my brain healing, though? Or is it waking up to a reality I'm not supposed to know? I nod my head, giving the doctor the impression that I'm in agreement with him. Inside, however, a fire has been lit. I am more determined than ever to unravel the truth that lurks behind the curtains of this hospital. The inconsistent memories, the unsettling flashbacks, the acronym DREAM, all these are puzzle pieces of a picture that is far more complex and sinister than a mere car accident. Trust is a luxury I can't afford right now, not even in myself. The secrets are stacking up, and every clue feels like both an answer and a new question. What I do know is that I can't let this go. A few days later, I step into my apartment after being discharged from the hospital. The atmosphere is heavy with a sense of neglect. My plants are wilted, and a thin layer of dust is visible on the furniture. I feel a sense of alienation. This space, filled with my personal belongings, somehow feels unfamiliar. My laptop is on the dining table, right where I left it before the accident. As I open the lid and the screen comes to life, a sense of urgency fills me. Ignoring the discomfort in my still recovering body, I immediately navigate to the desktop. There, disguised as an ordinary folder labeled Work Files, is something that catches my attention. I click on the folder, my heart pounding louder with each double click. 
Inside are files I have no recollection of creating, encrypted emails, strangely named documents, and images that make no sense. My frustration builds up as I begin to search through my emails. Who are these people discussing phase three inches and why are they doing it on my computer? I decide I need to get to the bottom of this and remember that decryption software exists for emails. A quick online search gets me a program that claims to break through most standard encryption algorithms. I download it, half expecting some sort of alarm to go off, but nothing happens. The software takes a while to work its magic. As I wait, my eyes drift around my apartment. Pictures of family and friends are displayed on the walls, but I look at them now with suspicion. Can I trust these people who claim to know me? Can I trust anyone? Finally, the program beeps. The emails are decrypted. I click on the first one and begin to read the first email. James. The next rendezvous is set. Meet at the designated location we discussed last week. Same time. Make sure you bring the updated lab specimens for Phase 3. Security protocols are in effect, so proceed with utmost discretion. Regards. Name redacted. Then I move on to the next one. James attached are the objectives for Phase 3. Memorize them and delete this email immediately after. Your role is crucial, so there can be no room for error. Check the files for further instructions. Email 3, James. The preliminary results from the last batch are promising. We are close to finalizing the serum. Your next sample delivery is crucial for the ongoing validation tests. Do not deviate from the established procedures. Best. Name redacted. Every new piece of information adds layers of complexity to the puzzle of my missing past yet provides no real answers. But one thing is certain. My life, as I knew it, has been a facade. Whatever is happening, it's big, complicated, and undoubtedly dangerous. And as much as it terrifies me, I know I can't ignore it any longer. After I finish reading the emails, I stare at the screen, my eyes dart back and forth over the words, as if a second or third reading might make them less confusing. My pulse is accelerating, and my breathing is shallow. These emails are mine, sent to my account, yet they're discussing things I have no memory of. I feel nauseous, and the room seems to spin for a moment. I grip the edge of the dining table to steady myself. It's clear that these aren't random or spam emails. The mention of Phase 3 objectives and ongoing validation tests raises questions that gnaw at me. What is Phase 3? What are these specimens, and why can't I remember any of it? I look around the room again, considering that I've become a paranoid stranger in my own home. These emails confirm my suspicions. Something is deeply wrong. I close the laptop. The normal life that I thought I was rebuilding now feels like a lie. And it's not just a matter of filling in memory gaps. It's starting to feel like a matter of life and death. I get up and move away from the computer, as if putting physical distance between me and the emails could somehow make them less real. It doesn't. I have to find out what's going on, no matter the risk. Over the next few days, my interactions with friends and family are now filled with tension. Every time they call or visit, I can't shake the feeling that they might be involved in whatever is happening to me. Their concern feels invasive, like they're prying into matters they shouldn't. I'm wary of their questions, their gestures, even the way they look at me. Each time they leave, I find myself mentally reviewing our interactions, looking for inconsistencies or signs that they might be lying to me. It's exhausting. I've even started to limit the information I share with them. Whenever they ask about my health or what the doctors are saying, I offer vague responses. I'm locking myself in, building walls to protect a secret I don't fully understand myself. I'm isolating myself, and I know it's affecting my relationships, but the stakes feel too high to act otherwise. That's why my eyes narrow when I see the name Alex in one of the decrypted emails on my computer. I pause, my cursor hovering over the text. 
The email thread involves planning and secret activities, and the acronym DREAM is mentioned repeatedly. Alex's name appears in the context of external oversight, and it looks like he's been trying to probe into the same project that's now haunting my thoughts. Intrigued and desperate for answers, I dig deeper into who this Alex is. It turns out he's a freelance journalist who's written articles questioning unethical governmental projects. Could he be an ally? Someone who can help me untangle this web? My curiosity outweighs my caution, which is saying a lot given my current state of mind. I compose an email to Alex. I'm careful with my words, framing them in a way that's as neutral as possible. I mention that we might have a mutual interest in the dream project and suggest that meeting up could be beneficial for both of us. My finger hovers over the send button momentarily before I finally click it. The email is gone, off into the ether, and now all I can do is wait for his response. Later in the day, Alex agrees to meet, saying he's also keen to discuss our mutual interest. Could this be the break I need to finally understand what's happening to me? I don't allow myself to get too optimistic. Caution still dominates my actions. I decide to meet Alex in a public place, somewhere we can talk but also somewhere I can easily leave if things start to feel off. While I don't know if I can trust him yet, I know that meeting Alex is a step I have to take. The following day I get to the cafe ten minutes earlier than the agreed-upon time. When Alex arrives, immediately I sense an air of urgency about him. He sits down across from me, making eye contact but skipping any social niceties. So, you've been digging where you shouldn't. Alex cuts right to the chase, clearly not a man to waste time. I need answers. I found emails on my own computer, things I don't remember ever writing or reading. Your name was in them, linked to this dream project. I lay out the situation as plainly as possible. Alex glances around, ensuring that no one is paying attention to our conversation. Then he leans in, his voice turning into a low whisper. The dream project is no joke. It's an actual government initiative with the goal of altering memories. They use it to make compliant agents, to tailor people into roles that suit their agenda. Both you and I are subjects in this experimental horror show. His words strike a nerve. It's one thing to suspect that something terrible is happening to you, but to hear it spoken out loud, confirmed by another person, is both validating and horrifying. I feel chills go down my spine. What do we do? How can we escape this? Escape? You can't really escape. They keep tabs on you, 24 sevenths. What you can do is gather evidence, Alex advises. Like what? I push, eager for some kind of action plan. Documents, names, dates, and inconsistencies in your medical records. Anything that can shed light on their activities. I've been compiling stuff for years. If anything happens to me, it'll go public automatically, he reveals. Suddenly, his phone buzzes, vibrating loudly on the wooden table. He glances at the screen, and his demeanor shifts. He looks uneasy. I have to leave, now, he states, pushing his chair back. Will we meet again? I ask. If we don't, search for my files. I've set them up to be released under specific conditions. You should arrange something similar, he advises. With that, Alex gets up and walks away, leaving me alone in the cafe contemplating what my life has become. Then, two days after our meeting, I find an article online about a fatal gas leak in Alex's apartment. The media paints a picture of an unfortunate mishap, a tragic accident that claimed the life of a man too young. But I can't shake the conviction that this is no accident. Alex is dead because he knew too much. His death serves as a chilling reminder of the stakes raising my sense of urgency to a new level. I remember his last words to me about gathering evidence, about having a contingency plan, and I know what I must do next. Sitting at my computer, I open the folder labeled Work Files, where my decrypted emails and unearthed documents reside. Each click feels like I'm treading further into dangerous territory, 
but there's no turning back now. I begin the painstaking process of sorting through the information and categorizing the files based on content and relevance. Emails talking about mysterious meetings go in one folder. Documents discussing phase three inches go in another. It's a nerve-wracking task, made worse by the ticking clock. I know that with each passing moment, I'm potentially drawing attention to myself. I also start to compile new evidence, digging deeper into my own past and any connections to the dream project. Medical bills, prescriptions, photos, anything that might serve as a puzzle piece in this twisted game becomes part of my growing cache of evidence. Then, I set up a secure cloud storage, password protected and encrypted, where I upload the files. I program it to send the contents to a few trustworthy journalists if I don't log in for a set number of days, emulating Alex's contingency plan. While doing all of this, I'm more cautious than ever. I change my daily routines, constantly looking over my shoulder, taking different routes when I go out. I know these precautions might be futile against an organization with seemingly limitless resources, but it's all I can do to feel even a shred of control. Friends and family continue to reach out, worried by my growing isolation, but I keep them at arm's length. How can I involve them in this dark reality? Their concern is genuine, but it only serves to complicate things further. I respond with vague assurances, never letting them get too close. Alex's death has made it clear that I'm not paranoid. I'm a target. The program is not a figment of my troubled mind. It is real, and it kills to protect its secrets. With frustration boiling inside me, I walk into the hospital that started this all. The sterile scent of antiseptic fills the air, but it's the answers that I'm after. This hospital, and more specifically the doctors here, are the most tangible connection to the convoluted mess that is now my life. Upon entering his office, Dr. Smith wears a smile that's all business. James, what brings you back? Your recovery is progressing as expected, I presume? His laid-back attitude irritates me, but I maintain my composure. My recovery isn't going as smoothly as you think. The flashbacks I'm experiencing don't align with the narrative of just a car accident. Settling into his chair, Dr. Smith takes on a measured expression. Flashbacks can be misleading, especially when you've recently experienced something as traumatic as you have. I lay it all out. The inconsistent memories, the decrypted emails, my contact with Alex, the overwhelming evidence that something far more complex is going on. My voice trembles with anticipation, waiting for the moment he shows some sign of guilt or acknowledgement. But he doesn't crack. Instead, he shifts in his seat and meets my gaze head on. James, I need to be clear with you. The dream project you're talking about doesn't exist. Your injuries were sustained in a car accident. Our team provided medical care, and that is the full scope of our involvement in your life. Exiting his office, I'm plagued by self-doubt that eats at the core of my resolve. Could it be possible that I've fabricated this complex web of deceit in my mind? Is my skepticism tipping over into full-blown paranoia? The doubts gnaw at me, making the line between reality and imagination increasingly difficult to distinguish. The very same night, another flashback grips me, more intense and violent than before. This time, I see myself in some kind of military gear, pointing a weapon at unarmed civilians. The memory jolts me out of sleep, soaked in sweat and gasping for air. The boundaries between reality and the product of a manipulated mind blur even more. Then suddenly, my phone buzzes on the table. An anonymous text. If you want the truth, Go to this address. A location is provided. Coordinates to a place far from the city. My instincts scream at me not to go. But can I afford not to? I drive through the emptiness of the night, finally reaching a dilapidated building that's hidden away from the main road. The structure looks like it's been deserted for a long time, with peeling paint and boarded-up windows. My heart is racing as I find an unsecured door and slip inside. 
The interior of the building offers a trove of incriminating evidence. There are cabinets filled with paper files, computer hard drives stacked on shelves, and a room with lab equipment that closely resembles the settings in my flashbacks. My phone is out, and I'm snapping pictures of everything that could be used to expose the truth. Documents, serial numbers on the equipment, even the layout of the place. As I do, a sense of dread intertwines with a feeling of vindication. I'm terrified, but also relieved to have tangible proof that I'm not delusional. Just when I think it's time to leave, my ears pick up the distinct sound of footsteps echoing through the empty halls. I freeze, my heart pounding even harder now. Before I have a chance to hide or run, someone grabs me from behind. Then, a cloth saturated with some chemical is pressed firmly against my mouth and nose. My vision blurs, my head spins, and then everything fades to black. I wake up disoriented, my eyes squinting against bright fluorescent lights above me. I'm lying on a hospital bed, but this isn't like any hospital I remember. Sterile white walls surround me, and I immediately notice several people in white coats. They're the ones from my memories, the ones I've been so desperately trying to piece together. Ah, you're awake, one of them says, walking closer to the bed. James, do you know why you're here? My mind races. Something tells me you're about to enlighten me. The doctor sighs. Your memory erasure was incomplete, it seems. You were never supposed to remember, let alone dig as deep as you did. So it's all true then, I say, my voice tinged with a mix of relief and terror. The dream project, the memory manipulation, everything. Yes, he admits. And now you have a choice. We can complete the memory erasure, let you go back to your normal life. You won't remember any of this, not even the investigation you've started. Or you can refuse, in which case you'll become a fugitive. We can't let you go with what you know. My heart pounds in my chest. If I choose to forget, how do I know you won't just kill me? You did it to Alex. His eyes narrow. Alex was a different case. He became too much of a liability. You still have a chance to live a normal life. I look around the room, weighing my options. Then... With a surge of resolve, I say, I can't forget. I won't. Very well, he says, signaling to someone behind him. Before they can move, I seize the moment. Calculating my odds, I pull off the monitors attached to me and lunge at the doctor closest to me, surprising him long enough to grab his security card. I sprint toward the door, swiping the card hastily. It works. I'm in the hallway now my bare feet slapping against the cold floor as alarms begin to blare. The building is a like maze, but I've been studying the layout from the files I found. Left, then right, down a flight of stairs. I can hear them behind me, their shouts echoing through the hallways. A few more turns, and I find what I'm looking for. A service exit. My heart is in my throat as I swipe the card one more time, praying it works. The door clicks open. I burst out into the night, my lungs burning with each gasp of fresh air. Sirens wail behind me, but I don't stop running until I reach a wooded area where I finally allow myself to pause and catch my breath. The dream project is real, and I have to do something about it.